Good morning. Hey, welcome to the coolest space in this convention. Isn't this great? I call this the NatCon nightclub. You're going to meet hundreds if not thousands of people at this convention. You already have. And truth be told, most of their names you will forget. Here's the nice part. You'll never forget my name. My name is Jerry Sandusky. <laughs> what can I tell you? I'm a big fan of getting that out of the way as early as possible. <laughs> and I'm going to make you feel a lot better, not related. <laughs> right? Hey, we all have our crosses to bear, but here's the nice part. I promise you, next week when you're recapping this convention, you'll remember my name. I'm your MC for today's Ignite NatCon, and here's the idea behind the Ignite presentations. The idea of Ignite is to create a spark to create a conversation, to share a passion, to make you think about something in a way perhaps you haven't thought about it before and to make you feel something you haven't felt before. We have five Ignite presenters today, and they come from varied backs, backgrounds and walks of life. Music, policy, professionals, chefs. You're going to hear, feel, and see a wide range in those five presentations today. And Ignite has a very clear format. It's 20 slides. Each slide auto forwards every 15 seconds. It's a five minute presentation. That's all the time you get. But here's the thing you'll discover about Ignite. That's all the time you need to ignite a spark and to create a conversation. Our first presenter is Dr. Bill Schmelter. Bill worked for 34 years in New York for the New York State Office of Mental Health. He's a psychologist. And as you can see, he's also a musician. He plays a bad blues guitar. I mean, he is a mean blues guitarist. Spent his last 10 years as a consultant with National Council, as well as with MTM Services. And Bill today is going to share some insights from his own battles with depression, but equally important insights for those who are friends and family members of those who suffer from depression. And Bill's presentation, appropriately named, is Depression is Better Than the Blues. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bill Schmelter. I know you've had your troubles I'm sure you've had the blues Maybe lost someone or something Had your share of bad news Don't want to minimize your problems But depression's better than the blues Say you've got a friend And that friend's got the flu You wouldn't stop And say stop feeling sorry for yourself Find something useful to do I know you wouldn't say it that But depression's better than the flu Two I know we can be a pain to be around All that complaining Weeping and bringing everybody down You know we try our best to hide it But sometimes the strangers can't be found 
Please don't say to exercise Please don't say to eat right No kink over loba, yoga Or stand into a light We can talk about that when I'm feeling better Right now just hope I can get some sleep tonight Now if you want to help And I know you do You might just say I can't imagine what you're going through If there's anything you need Friend, I'm here for you Pick up some slack Do it on the down low Take off the pressure Let them take it slow Educate yourself There might be things you need to know As it's bound to That's when you can work together Talk about the things they need to do To keep themselves afloat Remember depression's better than the blues If you know someone been trying to hide Pick up the phone and call him Swallow your pride That one phone call might just prevent a fatal slide Here's why. 
Carl rides a bike 2,000 miles a year. Folks, that's like riding your bike from Washington, D.C. to Denver, where he lives. And he does it in about seven months out of the year because the other five months they have snow every day in Denver. The reason he does that is Carl has discovered the power of the mind-body-soul link that motion creates. And he's going to talk about that. But he's also going to speak from the heart because he deals with what this conference deals with. The individual, the pain, and the agony. But he has found ways around it, not only for himself, but for all of those who he treats. And he has found the link in this, and it's the topic of his talk. If you want to move people, then move people. Carl Clark. <laughs> So, you have the most amazing organ on the planet, your brain. And frankly, your brain loves it when you move. In fact, the more you move, the better you think. I like moving on a bicycle. Colorado is a great place to do it. And the bike happens to be the most efficient way that a human being can move on the planet. friends. We have people now that watch the elite athletes uh, in cycling. You see people standing when they watch the pelotons just go streaming by, like the Tour de France and, of course, the Tour de Colorado. <laughs> there are places that um, mail is delivered by postal workers on bicycles. In many places in our country, we have police that do their beat on a bike. Now, the paleoanthropologists say this. We evolved while we were moving, not sitting. And in fact, if you look at um, our evolution, we on average were moving 12 miles a day. So our brains actually work the best. We're in a state of movement. Now, it's not just about the brain, though. It's about our overall physiology. So we know cardiovascular fitness improves. We know that our hearts will be healthier. Our muscle strength will be better if we get out and we do something regularly. And during that activity, though, a most amazing thing happens in the brain. Brain-derived neurotropic hormone is generated when we exercise. And that causes neurogenesis, meaning new brain cells are developed. And it's an excellent way to combat the effects of stress. If you are on a bike or exercise 20 minutes twice a week, it will actually decrease your chances of dementia by more than half. Well-being is a concept, PERMA, positive emotions, being engaged, relationships, doing something meaningful, and a sense of accomplishment. For me, I say a bike offers all those. When on my bike, positive emotions, when I see that kind of scene for my bike, it overwhelms me. I'm in a state of awe. And you can get that in every setting. Then when you're engaged, that's like you are there, you are nowhere else. You're not thinking about anything but how do I get across that bridge without crashing? <laughs> Engagement is when it goes timeless. The time just speeds by. And of course, 
I rarely find anybody in a bad mood on a bike. Those positive relationships are wonderful. When you're doing a trip together of going over a mountain pass with your friends, that warmth just wraps around you. How can it be meaningful? If we ride our bikes, we're doing something good for the planet. We're going to decrease our carbon footprint and I think make a significant difference. The last part about well-being is accomplishment. So this is me after I climbed one of the steepest climbs in the French Alps. And I can tell you, I still remember that moment. And I can get that good feeling anytime just reflecting back that, on that. So if you need to sit on your butt, I would suggest that you put your butt on a bike seat. <laughs> So, and why is that? It's good for your mind, it's good for your heart, and it's good for your soul. So, let's go. You knew you were going to find wisdom when you came to this conference. Mm -hmm. Did you think that wisdom was going to be, if you're going to sit on your butt, put your butt on a bike? I love it. There are certain lines you'll never forget. Now you see why he is the leader, because he leads with passion. Who here likes meatballs? Who likes meatballs? You're going to love our next presenter. Isabella has already lit up this conference with one of her cooking demo demos. Isabella is a local. She's from Orlando. And she is a chef, a caterer, a restaurateur. Her restaurant, the Meatball Shop, is famous locally and probably will be famous nationally soon for what she does with food. She's obviously a woman who's passionate about cooking. But here's the magic she'll share with you today. Isabella has found the link between food and family. And in doing so, she has taken that relationship and expanded the meaning of family to reach entire communities. She is changing her community by changing relationships by changing the way we look at food. Isn't it time we all made that change? Ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to Orlando's own Isabella Morgia de Vicari. Excuse me. That is her husband, I believe. Yes. <laughs> that is not, but I got a kiss too. <laughs> the Italian, I just can't help myself. Buongiorno. Yes, my name is Isabella Morgetti Vicari, and I come from a very close Italian familia, as you can see, a familia that lives and breathes family, tradition, and roots. The familia that has taught me how to love and how to make room for one more on the table. You always have room for one more. A familia don't that won't let you go no matter what. We have so many wonderful things that take place at the table and we've learned with just a few ingredients like the pomodoro, the basil, aglio, basilico. Yes, these beautiful things, simple ingredients, we can make a dish fit for a king. <clears throat> and these were the riches that I was raised with, not fancy material things. And it's because of this love and desire in my heart I ask, how do we share this with children and families that have not been raised with these love values? You see, these are the values that we need to bring back. And this is how we make it happen. The Community International Culinary Program was designed by my husband, Jeff, and I. Yes, this program is for the children, for the most impoverished children in our communities. You see, this program is more than just food. It's about bringing the families <laughs> back together. As you can see, yes, Jeffy, a man with heart and soul like none other. I swore I'd never marry my own kind, and I happily eat those words at the table every day. <laughs> Couldn't help myself, honey. But you see, the program is all about this. Hear me, the program is not about food. It's about feeding the families, spiritually, emotionally, physically, using the vehicle of food to teach them that the tools of the kitchen are the tools for life. 
And so most of the children in my program are black. And I wanted to take them back to their roots and their traditions, so I taught them how to make this wonderful dish, this African stew with ingredients that they've never even heard of, with ingredients that they've never tasted. And they absolutely loved it. And I taught them this African quote that is known all throughout the world that says, if you want to go fast, run alone. But if you want to go far, you run together. And that's what we do, isn't it, community? And that's what they need to do. And through community and through technology, I was able to do a Google Hangout. And this is my baby, Gabriele. And Gabriele works for Google. He's 26 years old. And he has been with Google for four years. Understand something. He's only a few years older than the children that I teach. What an inspiration that he has been to these children. These children saw that you can experience amazing things. He shared that he jumped off of this cliff in Singapore. And what an amazing experience. And we want these children to feel that. And then I brought my mama to the class, that beautiful blonde, yes, is my mama. And I shared her story. And I wanted them to learn her beautiful dish, pasta pizzerli. But the story goes like this. She was raised in Italia, in Fiume. Fiume, Italia is a northern city. And something terrible happened. This terrible man that you will know, and his name is Tito. Tito burned their house down, and he took them prisoners. And they lived in his concentration camp for 12 years. Now, at this moment in time, you should have seen the faces on these children. And I said to them, do any one of you kids right now want to trade places with my mom? And they immediately said, no. I don't want to. I don't want to be that. She looks so beautiful on the outside. She looks like she's got the world. And I said, don't you ever forget this lesson. The lesson is because everything looks beautiful on the outside doesn't mean that you suffer on the inside. And you see these beautiful children suffer too. But I want them to know that they matter. These children do matter. And they have the ability, all right, to change the generations of their families by breaking those chains. And how do we help them break it? By educating them, by teaching them that they can. And you see, we just can't lecture to these children. What do we do? We need to bring them in. We need to bring them into families, family like ours. Each and every one of us have been blessed in this room far beyond what we deserve. Would you not agree? That's you and me. You see, food is the entry point to reaching these children. You see, everybody can relate to food. Everybody loves to eat. They get it. You see, we teach these children how to cook, and we say that cooking will open up the door to these children. But you know what? Food will open up their mouths and will open up their hearts and you will find out, and you will see the transformation in these children, that you can change your life by changing your heart. And that is a fact. Grazie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. God, I'm hungry. I told you, it's about passion, it's about heart, it's about the courage to speak from your heart and the courage to share your vision for the world. Our next speaker is from Washington, D.C. She's from the National Council. Rebecca Farley is the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the National Council. Rebecca is the kind of person who makes me believe in America, who makes me believe in the future. I'm 53, so I'm just at that group of people now who, if you, if you sit in a restaurant and you listen to the conversations at the bar, you'll hear people my age say things like, oh my God, I don't know about these damn kids today. The future doesn't look bright with them. <laughs> don't believe a single one of them. People like Rebecca make me believe that America will be stronger in the next century than it has been for the past two centuries. And here's why. Rebecca started in Wisconsin, working in the state senate. And like many people in politics, she got disillusioned. She saw the waste. She saw the stupidity. She mm. saw the laziness. But here's what separates Rebecca from so many others. She didn't stop looking there. She took the time and the effort to see the potential. The potential in the power. And then she rededicated her career to do something about it. And that's why her presentation is, Democracy is Dead. Long live democracy. Rebecca Farley. Mm. 
Today, I'll tell you the story about two men with long hair and why our democracy is dead. This is my grandpa. He was a fiery liberal with a long white ponytail who always carried a copy of the Constitution in his shirt pocket. This is Russell Brand. He's a notorious partier and celebrity with a disheveled mullet who said, apathy is a rational reaction to a system that no longer hears or represents the vast majority of people. If my grandpa knew who Russell Brand was, and that's doubtful, he could not have disagreed more. My grandparents are the people whose idea of a great birthday present was a donation to the Senate candidate of my choice. <laughs> But apathy is such an appealing reaction to our disgust with special interest groups that spend millions in dark money on campaigns in the few remaining swing districts that haven't been permanently gerrymandered into the control of one party or another, and a Congress that can't seem to get anything done, even on issues where virtually all Americans agree. <coughs> when only 36% of the electorate can hold their noses long enough to vote, when only 15% of the public thinks their member of Congress cares about them, when, only seven, when Congress has only a 7% approval rating, that is why I say our democracy is dead. But to adapt the words of the old chant, democracy is dead. Long live democracy. Democracy is spreading through everything that we do. We've seen the democratization of information, where with an internet connection, anyone can be an investigative journalist, and we all have a microphone to make our voices heard. We've seen the democratization of commerce, where social entrepreneurs are connecting buyers to sellers, think Etsy, or doing an end run around non-responsive industries with inferior service, think Uber or Lyft, and they're doing so in a way that creates new connections and communities among users, yet at the same time empowers consumers to take charge of their own solutions. So it's no wonder in this age of widespread democratization and empowerment that we are losing faith in the one institution that has failed to adapt, our actual democratic government. So yes, we're infuriated. Yes, we're disgusted. We're apathetic because we think that nothing we do can make a difference. But we're looking at it all wrong. As Thomas Edison said, discontent is the first necessity of progress. And I believe in the power of our imagination and our collective voices to bring us to a better future. But we can't get there by being disengaged because power concedes nothing without demand. So, are you mad? Good, take that and use it. Use it by voting in every election, by calling out the BS that you see on campaign ads, by talking to your members of Congress about the things that concern you, by being reasonable yet vocal in the face of partisan hysteria, by engaging with outside groups like the National Council that are engaging in smart and goal-driven political action. And uh, did I mention by voting? Because the special interests and partisans are always going to show up to vote. They're always going to be there in the halls of Congress to make their voices heard. And when the rest of us stay home on election day, those voices win. They win when we don't speak up for what we believe in. When you don't speak up, when you don't speak up. So together, we need to stand up, get engaged with us, because together, we're demanding change from those in power, and we're going to get it. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> my, my grandpa never lost his faith that despite our disagreements, we the people um, you know, acting for a common cause could accomplish a better future. He even spent time in the last weeks of his life on a cruise ship with a bunch of other passionate people who wanted to change the world. His friends told us later that he was as animated and energized as he had ever been by the prospects for change. Russell Brand, that other man with the long hair, actually went on to say um, that apathy is our biggest obstacle to change. But we are far from apathetic, far from impotent. Now is the time for us to wake up. Grandpa would agree.
I told you you'd feel good about the future after you met Rebecca. <laughs> and you will feel great about the present you. when you meet our next presenter. Our next presenter is a world-class classical violinist. Jihae Park comes to us from South Korea, but she is literally a citizen of the world. Jihae was born and raised in Germany. She performs around the world. Jihae's accomplishments for such a young woman, astounding. She's the Honorary Ambassador of UNESCO for the National Committee of Korea. She's a jury member of the International Music Competition in Italy. But she has a very personal story that she will share with her music and her words. Jihae has suffered from depression and suffered mightily. And music saved her. But music not only saved Jihae, now it saves others who fight depression. And in her presentation, how music saved her soul from the dark night of depression. Ladies and gentlemen, the fabulous Miss G.A. Park. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. When I look back, this is simply a miracle for me, being in front of you today, as I suffered from severe depression myself for years. In my deepest and darkest hours, however, I felt the true healing power of music that restored my soul. It totally changed my perspectives on, li on my life, and it set me free from the pressure of becoming a successful violinist. And this made my life now so much better, happier, and even more successful than I could have ever imagined. Now traveling all over the world, I'm not only active as a classical musician, but also as a speaker and messenger. Just mention a few. Um, Music has been my channel to um, comfort the others while being myself through it. My audience is anybody who has heard to listen, and even those who are not familiar with uh, Mr. Bach and Beethoven. And my stages are everywhere where I can share this amazing power of music. It can be prison and churches, hospitals, anywhere practically, and also um, prestigious concerts like Carnegie Hall or Kennedy Center. Now, I'd like to continue with the music that I began with. Um, it is composed by Handel originally. Uh, it's called Saraband. Here with, I would like to say personally my thank you and bless all of you for your tremendous effort and lifelong dedication for serving people who are going through their hardest um, time in their life, just like me once. Um, here's only for you. My dedication to you in one and only version of Handel's Sarban.
Jihei Park. <laughs> Carl and Rebecca, Bill, come on up, please. Would, would each of our presenters come on up? Carl and Rebecca, Bill, Isabella, come on up. Come on in, guys. Each of you come on in. One last round of applause for five of the most courageous people I know. NatCom Ignite, thank you all very much. Thank each of you, my courageous friends. Well done.